Hey everybody, this is Lex Rofberg, and we're giving a little bit of a preamble before this episode as one of our High Holiday episodes. Uh, initially, it was released in 2016 slash 5777, uh, right at the beginning of 5777, as we entered that new year. Uh, but we're re-releasing it this year because we think that these conversations about the Torah readings and Haft Torah readings from the High Holidays are still relevant. And uh, we didn't re-record new ones. We, As much as our ideas change, they haven't changed so much that we have whole new takes on these texts. But we wanted to put them out there for you anyway to, if you listened the first time, revisit. And if you didn't, uh, to visit for the first time. So we hope you enjoy these and uh, send us whatever feedback you've got at dan at judaismunbound.com or lex at judaismunbound.com. Shana Tova, Happy New Year. This is a special edition of Judaism Unbound, the High Holiday Readings. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofus. And we're here with a special edition of Judaism Unbound today that actually is putting together a number of shorter pieces that you can find on our website, www.judaismunbound.com, in our special section on the High Holidays. We're going to be talking about each of the traditional readings for the High Holidays and looking at them with a Judaism Unbound perspective to try to find a way to see whether these traditional uh, readings can still be relevant to us today as we potentially look at these holidays in a new way. All right, for our final reading, we're going to look at the Haftorah reading for the afternoon service of Yom Kippur, which is the book of Jonah, the whole book. Uh, it's four chapters, so you pack the whole thing into that afternoon service. And the book of Jonah is, on one level, it's a story. Um, it's an entire story, beginning, middle, end, which is different from some of the other readings that we've looked at, really all of them that are placed in the midst of longer books like Leviticus or Isaiah or Jeremiah, etc. But the book of Jonah, the content of the story is that you've got a protagonist whose name is Jonah, who initially, he's in conversation with God, so he's a prophet. And the issue of concern relates to the city of Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, which is facing the possibility of destruction. And initially, Jonah is not, Jonah wants to prevent that destruction. What happens is there's this intriguing boat journey that Jonah goes on. He is in a position where he's disobeyed God, and, and the result is that there's consequences for the entire boat. There's, a, you know, torrential weather that endangers everyone. And he realizes that it's his fault. So he jumps off um, and in order to save the rest of the people on the boat. And he's swallowed by a, a big fish, a dog gadol. And he's in this big fish for three days and eventually is sort of spit or vomited up. Um, and eventually um, he, God, God actually makes the decision not to destroy the city of Nineveh. And Jonah is aggravated by this. Jonah, um, Jonah now at this point thinks that that God should have exercised that that attribute of of more judgment oriented. Um, and Jonah says so. And then it concludes with this fascinating parable where where there's this tree that God puts right near Jonah to provide some shade, and and um, and it's there for a, a short while, and then. The tree, God destroys the tree, and Jonah is outraged and and ready to you know die for this tree, and sort of the moral of that is that is that you know if Jonah if you were willing to to die on behalf of this you know tree, all, uh, how can you imagine how difficult it would be for me to to put the lives of all these human beings I've created in Nineveh on the line by destroying their city? So it's a it's a jam packed few chapters with a lot going on, but that's sort of a summary of, of the book. Yeah. So do you have an angle on it that you think is a particularly Judaism unbound angle? Yeah, I do. And it relates to this issue with the big fish, with the dog adult. So often, you know, at least for me, and I think for others, uh, the my exposure to this story was primarily as sort of a cutesy child story without any of the big theological questions of of what it means for God to destroy cities. Um, it, it was just about, ooh, you know, Jonah is swallowed by a whale. Fascinating. Um, maybe we'll draw a picture of it in Sunday school. Uh, that was my first engagement with this story. It was, that wasn't a bad thing. I mean, it, it's fun. Um, 
but as I grew older, I was in a variety of Jewish spaces where, you know, a rabbi or somebody would be giving their spiel on this book, whether it was on Yom Kippur or elsewhere during the year, just because it's, you know, a, a book in the Bible. And they would emphasize that it's not a whale. Um, it, and it's not. Um, the, the character of, of that we refer to as the whale is referred to in Hebrew as Dag Gadol, which means a big fish. And of course, we know now that whales aren't fish. Whales are mammals. And as a result, it would conceivably be anachronistic or incorrect to call it a whale when it says that in the text that it's a fish. And I think, uh, and so for a while, I totally bought into that. And if people would tell me, you know, in conversation, reference Jonah and the whale, I would vigilantly correct them and say, no, 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 not a whale. It's a fish. But so I was curious about this and I looked into some of the linguistic history of of Dag Gadol and how it's been translated into various languages over time. And there's basically a reason that we ended up with the conclusion that this is a whale. And the short of it is that when when the Septuagint was written, which is the Greek translation of of the Bible, it translated that word in a way that resembled a Greek version of big fish. But the term resembled a word for sea monster. Then it transitioned into Latin, um, still another language. And, and so we had a new connotation for this big fish. And it was related to a word that some might recognize from the word cetyl alcohol, but the, the Latin root is sort of the C-E-T part, which relates to whales. Um, and so it became a whale. And so on the one hand, there's we could look at this and say, you know, what a shame. We lost the original intent of this story to be a big fish. You know, maybe it's not of huge concern to us, whether it's a fish or a whale, but, but on some level we've lost the, that Hebrew Dagadol, and maybe that's a signifier that you know we've lost a connection to this story, or even to our our way of interpreting text in general. Um, the other way to relate to this is that maybe now it's a whale. Um, maybe the original the original writing of the text is not the only authentic version, and just because a new translation isn't true or faithful to that original, maybe it actually can be a whale now, if for whatever reason that adds to the story. I don't know enough about, you know, the biology of whales to think about how that could impact the story. Maybe somebody else who's a marine biologist does. But on a broader level, I think this suggests that the way we interpret text in general can be open to these shifts over time. And we don't have to necessarily see them as mistakes that are to be corrected, but instead as new ways of understanding a text. So maybe now it's a sea monster. Maybe it was a big fish. Maybe we can look at all of those and, and analyze the differences and see how that might impact our reading of the text. Dan, did you have any other thoughts? Well, I was just going to ask you, you know, so so what if it is a whale or a big fish? But I understand that you're saying that it's a metaphorical issue, you know, for sort of the larger approach that we have to texts. And, it's a whale uh, of an issue. You know, I was thinking, yeah, and I, it was uh, making me think a little bit about um, the book, uh, The Grammar of God by Avia Kushner, which I haven't read yet. I started it, um, but it's an interesting book that I'm looking forward to reading. And my understanding is that um, it's about a writer who went to study at the University of Iowa writing program with uh, Marion Robinson, who's the author of uh, a number of amazing pieces of literature, most famously Gilead and and uh, I think the other one is called Housekeeping. And she's very connected to the Bible, but very connected to the English Bible, right? She's not Jewish, and she um, grew up and reading the English Bible. And, and it's a story of the Jewish authors going to her class and being sort of struck by how, in her mind initially, much of what was being said was mistranslation, you know, and, and I think that it's about an ultimate understanding that the Bible in English becomes simply a, a different work of literature that, that is also enormously powerful and enormously powerful for people and that people have built lives around. And, and so it's not always a question of um, which is the correct reading 
but also understanding that a, a work of literature can, um, in a sense, become a new work of literature over time. Battle doesn't have to be over the original intent, but also over the present meaning. And, and, and I think that's really interesting. What I wanted to add uh, in terms of another thing that I was thinking about in, in looking at this text this year was that most of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible are called by God to prophesy to or against the Israelite kings, the kings of, of Israel, the kings of Judah. And that is made even sort of more clear by looking at this text as, in, in a sense, the exception that proves the rule. And um, here Jonah is being called to prophesy to or against the king of Assyria. It get, gets me thinking about in, in this season, you know, it get, gets me thinking about this question that I feel like in our times, we seem to have the sense in many Jewish communal endeavors that the prophetic voice of Judaism is to be directed at non-Jews, right? That somehow um, having access to the prophetic voice in Judaism makes us more likely or, you know, we should get involved in American politics, um, you know, in, in, in civil rights movement and things like that, which of course we should. But it feels to me like we generally don't turn that prophetic voice on ourselves to that same extent anymore. And reading this text and thinking about it on Yom Kippur and looking at this as the exceptional text in which our um, prophetic voice was turned on non-Jews or on the larger world, you know, which includes Jews, um, and that the rule is that our prophetic voice should be turned upon ourselves makes me sensitive to the idea that w let's go back and turn the prophetic voice upon ourselves. And here I'm not, that the prophetic voice can be misunderstood, I think, to be one that's essentially putting down those who are in power. I, and, and I don't think that that's the prophetic voice at its best. I, th I think the prophetic voice has, at its best is a voice that's concerned about the future and that is, in a sense, warning those who are in power that if you don't uh, think about these things in a different way, this bad future is going to be our fate and our doom. And it shouldn't be understood to be one that is just wagging a finger and saying, you know, you are bad, any more so than we feel comfortable with the idea that our religious leaders would be wagging the finger at the congregation and saying, you're not living a good Jewish life. I instead, the conversation that we should be having uh, and with each other is this question of um, what is going to happen if we continue along this route and are we willing to shift course? And, you know, it's so interesting that in the book of Jonah, you know, unlike, again, unlike most of the cases in which the prophet turned his, usually his attention to the uh, Israelite kings and, and the Israelite kings ignored the prophet or, or worse, that in this case, the king of Nineveh, the king of Assyria actually listens to Jonah and Jonah is somehow aggrieved by that. Um, and, and, and I think it puts us, uh, you know, in, in a, it raises a lot of really interesting uh, questions about what prophecy is, what we should want it to be, to whom it should be directed, and what would happen if the prophetic voice was actually uh, heard. Um, and, and maybe this will be the year that, that, that some voices that are raising concerns about continuing on this new path and also offering a different path to go down, uh, you know, perhaps this year, and we'd say this every year, you know, perhaps this year will be the year when we start to explore other paths even more vigorously than we currently are. Sort of in closing for this whole project of mini episodes that we've been doing for these these different readings, I thought that it might be important to to also suggest with this book of Jonah that it's it's just a good story. Like I, in addition to all of the the nuggets of wisdom that we can we can pull from from elements of the story from particular verses um and that's the same with all of these other texts i, I also we we sometimes fail to to back out and recognize that you know we've got some just great literature in in our in our jewish toolbox of text and i think that the book of jonah is a great example of that i think many of the books in the the writings section of the bible are good examples of that and in addition to mining the depths of these texts for wisdom, I hope that this high holiday season and in the future, we can enjoy these pieces of literature as, you know, 
fun, interesting, worthwhile texts to think about and and learn from. You know, I I hope that this high holiday season we were able to help with that through these various recordings. And um, I'd also encourage you to see if there's other ways to to add bits and pieces to your experience, either through our High Holidays Unbound experience online on our website, judaismunbound.com, or through exploring the various offerings of other organizations too. Yeah. And I just want to reinforce what you're saying and and add to it this idea that, you know, I, I don't think that we should get too hung up on why these texts were chosen for these holidays by the people who chose them long ago. I mean, I think that could be an interesting discussion in its own right. But I also think that it's almost like wandering through the stacks of the library and something catches your eye. You know, I, I, I almost think the sort of randomness of having these texts um, available on these holidays is, is just something that allows us to be creative and to think, you know, not why did the person who chose this text for this holiday choose it, but more, is there a connection that we can make through this random text and this random holiday and um, actually something interesting comes out of it? And at least that's been kind of, uh, to some extent, the spirit that I've been trying to to, to explore these texts with. And and I would really also encourage people to, to do that too. And if these texts don't speak to you, you know, just open the book randomly to some other text, you know, and you're, <laughs> when you're sitting um, either in synagogue or not in synagogue, just sort of open it to a random page and just kind of ask yourself this question, can I draw a meaningful connection between this text and this season? And and I think that the creativity that that kind of question that assumes that, yes, I can draw that kind of connection, uh, and then the only question is, what is it going to be, is the kind of way of framing the question that, that opens up maximal creativity. And, 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 and I really am hoping that our holidays can become these times of creativity when we're just kind of focused on Judaism for this day here and there, you know, rather than seeing them as these days of kind of um, conservation of like we talked about in an earlier episode of like photocopying what was done in the past, but using them as these um, opportunities scattered throughout the year to just engage in creative thinking and that that creative thinking can be done literally by opening a random page and, and thinking about, you know, is there some connection I could draw? You know, I'd love to know what comes out on the other end of that. Absolutely. And uh, so on that note, we want to encourage you to be in touch with us. We didn't do this for all of our middle episodes, but because this is the final of our of our eight mini episode series, we'd love we'd love to encourage you to be in touch with us. And uh, there's a few ways for you to do that. One is through our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. Uh, give us a like there. Another is through our website, JudaismUnbound.com, where you can find all of these recordings, and you can also find a variety of other fun, interesting, inspiring high holiday resources. And the last is that you can send us emails at lex at nextjewishfuture.org or dan at nextjewishfuture.org. And if you're really jazzed by what we produced and you'd like to support us with a small financial donation on a, on a monthly basis, you can do so at our Patreon page, which you can find at www.patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Judaism Unbound. With that, this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>